Hi everyone, in this video we will be going over the factors that affect blood flow, otherwise referred to as hemodynamics. Before we jump into hemodynamics, it is important to identify and characterize the seven types of blood vessels. It's important to take into account the vessel type when discussing hemodynamics because certain vessel types have specific characteristics that can impact blood flow. Let's first start with elastic arteries. They serve as pressure reservoirs and maintain the driving force for blood flow. Their layers consist of endothelium, a basement membrane, smooth muscle, fibrous connective tissue, and a large amount of elastic connective tissue. Some examples include the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Next are muscular arteries. They have a lower capability to recoil and propel blood compared to elastic arteries, but they are capable of greater vasoconstriction and vasodilation. They contain more smooth muscle and less connective tissue compared to elastic arteries. They make up the majority of arteries in the body. Next are arterioles, which are known as resistant vessels because their small diameter provide the greatest resistance to blood flow. Vasoconstriction of arterial increases resistance even more and decreases blood flow into capillaries. Vasodilation of arterial decreases resistance and increases blood flow into capillaries. Their layers consist of endothelium, a basement membrane, smooth muscle, and a small amount of connective tissue. Next are capillaries. They are the smallest blood vessels of the body and are known as exchange vessels because their primary function is the exchange of nutrients, waste, and gases in the blood due to their large surface area. Their layers consist of endothelial cells surrounded by a basement membrane. No smooth muscle or connective tissue is present. This means the layer is thin, which facilitates nutrient and waste exchange. The capillary walls also contain pores that permit the passage to certain substances. Capillaries are found extensively in body tissues, especially those with high metabolic requirements like muscles, the brain, liver, and kidneys, which use more oxygen and nutrients. Next are venules, which are microscopic veins that drain capillary blood and begin the return of blood back to the heart. Their layers consist of endothelium surrounded by a basement membrane, smooth muscle, and a thin layer of connective tissue. Next are medium veins. These vessels are important because they transfer blood from tissues back to the heart. Veins have valves that aid with the movement of blood to the heart by preventing backflow. Veins have several tissue layers like arteries, such as endothelium, a basement membrane, smooth muscle, and elastic and fibrous connective tissue. However, they have thinner walls and much less smooth muscle and elastic tissue. These veins make up the majority of veins in the body. Lastly, we have large veins. They are important because they empty blood into the heart's right atrium. They have an endothelium, a basement membrane, smooth muscle, as well as elastic and fibrous connective tissue. Some examples include the inferior and superior vena cava. Blood flow is the volume of blood that flows through any tissue during a given time period, most often expressed as milliliter per minute or centimeter cube per second. The three main factors that affect blood flow are the pressure gradient that drives blood flow through tissues, velocity in which blood flows, and resistance to blood flow encountered within blood vessels. The relationship between blood flow and the two most adjustable main factors, which are pressure gradient and resistance, can be explained by this equation. Force is equal to the change in pressure divided by the resistance. From the equation, we can see that blood flow is directly proportional to the pressure gradient and inversely proportional to resistance. Because blood flows from regions of higher pressure to regions of lower pressure, this means that the greater the pressure gradient, the greater the blood flow. On the other hand, the greater the resistance, the lower the blood flow. Now we will discuss the solid and diastolic blood pressures and vessel types with respect to their effects on pressure gradient and blood flow. Let's first start with some basic definitions. Blood pressure is simply defined as the hydrostatic pressure exerted by blood against the walls of blood vessels. Let's first turn our attention to the artery section of this graph. We see how the systolic pressure is the highest pressure in the arteries during systole coinciding with ventricular contraction. And the diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure in the arteries during diastole, coinciding with ventricular filling slash relaxation. Now recall how blood flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, and thus the greater the pressure gradient, the greater the blood flow. Because it is a contraction of the heart that generates the highest pressure, that is systolic pressure, blood will move down the pressure gradient away from the heart to the distant tissues. Also, keep in mind that the aorta and other large elastic arteries will have the highest blood pressure compared to other blood vessels. This is because they receive blood immediately from the heart. As blood moves away from the heart into the elastic arteries, then into muscular arteries, 
then into arterioles and so on, the blood pressure continues to drop. The pressure decreases because there is more distance from the pumping mechanism, that is the heart. As such, blood flow slows down. Think of it as if you are in one area on a bicycle and someone pushes you. The push is like the heart, and as you move further from the source of push, you slow down. Makes sense, right? Once blood enters the venules and veins, blood pressure is so low that it barely makes it back to the heart's right atrium. Luckily, there are a few mechanisms to increase blood flow through the venous system due to the valves found in veins. However, it is something that will not be discussed in this video. In summary, remember that pressure decreases going from large arteries to large veins, which is supported by the graph as we can see a downward trend. The first factor that we will discuss is the pressure gradient, which describes how blood will flow from high pressure to low pressure through a blood vessel. The pressure gradient is influenced by three factors, vessel type, vascular compliance, and cardiac output. To better understand how the pressure gradient affects blood flow, let's first consider different scenarios where we have different pressures at each end of a blood vessel. Let's first take a look at this example. When there is a pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury at one end, we will denote that as P1. When there is a pressure gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury at the other end, we will denote that as P2. If we take the difference, that gives us a pressure gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury. When we have a pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury at one end, denoted as P1, and a pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury at the other end, denoted as P2, the difference results in a pressure gradient of 80 millimeters of mercury. Comparing the two gradients, we will see a greater blood flow in the second example with a pressure gradient of 80 millimeters of mercury compared to the first example with a pressure gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury. This is because the greater the difference P1 and P2, the greater the blood flow. In the case where there is no pressure gradient, which is when both P1 and P2 are the same, there will be no blood flow. For example, let's say that P1 and P2 are both 70 millimeters of mercury then there will be no blood flow. Something else that is important to keep in mind is that blood vessels of the same size can have different pressures at each end, but if the pressure gradients are the same, then blood flow will be the same as well. For example, let's compare the following pressure gradients in two blood vessels that are the same size. For vessel one, we see that P1 is 70 millimeters of mercury and P2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. This means that the pressure gradient is 30 millimeters of mercury. For vessel two, we see that P1 is 50 millimeters of mercury and P2 is 20 millimeters of mercury. This means that the pressure gradient is also 30 millimeters of mercury. This shows how two blood vessels of the same size can have different pressures at the ends, but if the pressure gradients are the same, then blood flow will be the same. One analogy to think of is a series of hills and you on a bicycle. On a hill with a steep gradient, you will go down fast without pedaling. On a hill with a moderate gradient, you will go down at a moderate speed without pedaling. On a flat ground with no gradient, you won't move at all. Lastly, let's go over one final factor that affects the pressure gradient. This is blood vessel compliance, which is the ability of a blood vessel to stretch without pressure changing significantly. Blood vessels with high compliance will show only a small increase in blood pressure despite a large increase in blood volume. This is because of the low amount of smooth musculature in their vessel walls. So these vessels are highly flexible. For example, veins, as we can see here, have thinner walls compared to arteries. In blood vessels with low compliance, a small increase in blood volume causes a large increase in blood pressure. This is because these vessels have a relatively high amount of smooth musculature in their vessel walls, and therefore, cannot stretch as much to accommodate the blood volume increase. For example, arteries, as we can see here, have a high amount of smooth musculature. Vascular compliance plays a role in the pressure gradient in blood flow because arteries are the least compliant and therefore have high pressure, while veins are the most compliant and therefore have low pressure. This is another aspect ensuring that the pressure gradient is maintained and blood flow can continue going from high pressure to low pressure from the heart to arteries, to capillaries, to veins, and back to the heart. This is supported by this compliance curve. The slope of the curve is the compliance. As we can see, veins have a higher compliance compared to arteries at almost any given pressure. Ultimately, 
their compliance will be the same as the pressure continues to increase. But at low pressures, the venous compliance is about 10 to 20 times greater than the arterial compliance. Now let's discuss the second factor that affects blood flow, velocity, which is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area, which is depicted by this graph. Velocity is slowest where the total sectional area is greatest, which we can see is the case in the capillaries. Each time an artery branches, the total sectional area increases, and as a result, the velocity of blood flow becomes slower. For example, if we compare a narrow versus a broad river, we see that the narrow river will flow at a faster rate compared to the broad river. This is because anything that increases the surface area of the channel against which the water flows will tend to slow the flow because of the increase in friction. In the same way, blood flow becomes slower as the surface area increases because the blood interacts more with the blood vessel walls. Thus, as blood approaches the capillaries, the blood flow is slower because capillaries have the largest surface area out of all of the blood vessels, which is due to their dense branching. The relatively slow rate of blood flow through capillaries is vital to ensure the proper exchange of materials between the blood and interstitial fluid. Once blood passes through the capillaries and into the venules, the venules converge to form veins and the blood flow speeds up again. In summary, the velocity of blood flow decreases as blood flows from the aorta into the muscular arteries, into arterioles, and into capillaries before increasing as blood leaves the capillaries and enters the venules and then veins. The last factor we will discuss and the most important when it comes to impacting blood flow is resistance, which is the opposition to blood flow due to friction between blood and the walls of the blood vessels. In other words, increasing resistance in a blood vessel will decrease blood flow. There are three factors that affect resistance, which are blood viscosity, blood vessel length, and blood vessel radius. The equation here is used to explain the relationship between resistance and these three factors. Resistance is equal to blood viscosity times blood vessel length divided by blood vessel radius to the power of four. Resistance to blood flow is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the blood vessel. Therefore, the smaller the radius, the greater the resistance. Because blood vessel radius is raised to the fourth power, it is the main determinant of resistance. So small changes in radius size can cause large changes in resistance. Let's briefly go over some examples of blood vessels with different resistance values. Consider the following three blood vessels, which have different radii, but the same pressure gradient. For blood vessel A, the radius, resistance, and blood flow are all equal to one. The radius of blood vessel B is one half that of blood vessel A. And as a result, the resistance is 16 times greater and the flow is 16 times slower than vessel A. For vessel C, the radius is one fourth that of vessel A. Thus, resistance is 256 times greater and flow is 256 times slower than vessel A. Now we will go over the three main factors that affect resistance. We will first discuss blood viscosity, which is a measure of fluid consistency or thickness. For example, think of water, blood, and honey. Honey is the most viscous, with blood being significantly less viscous and water being non-viscous. From the equation, we can see that resistance to blood flow is directly proportional to the viscosity of blood. Thus, the higher the blood viscosity, the higher the resistance, and the lower the blood flow. The viscosity of blood depends on the ratio of erythrocytes to plasma volume. Here, we can see that this blood sample has a greater ratio of red blood cells to plasma, and therefore it is more viscous compared to this one. Now let's go over a couple of examples. Dehydration increases resistance because the volume of plasma decreases, resulting in a higher ratio of red blood cells to plasma. Another example is seen with athletes who have taken synthetic erythropoietin drugs to increase their red blood cell count, which in turn increases the oxygen carrying capacity in their blood. Abuse of these drugs can cause so many red blood cells to be in the blood that it becomes too viscous to flow efficiently. If severe enough, blood flow will be greatly hindered, clots may form, and blood may not even be able to make it back to the heart. On the other hand, overhydration will cause viscosity and resistance to decrease because the ratio of red blood cells to plasma decreases. If severe enough, blood flow will be too fast for proper exchange of nutrients and waste products to occur in the capillaries.
The next factor to discuss that affects resistance and blood flow is blood vessel length. From the equation, we can tell that resistance to blood flow through a vessel is directly proportional to the length of a blood vessel. As such, the longer the blood vessel, the greater the resistance, and the lower the blood flow. An example of when blood vessel length increases is when people gain excessive weight and become obese, a real problem here in the United States. Due to the increased vascularization of the adipose tissue, blood vessel length increases and blood has to be moved an even farther distance than normal, which the heart may or may not be able to accommodate. An analogy can be seen if you look at a car in certain distances it needs to move. If you push on the gas pedal, this is like the heart's pumping force, the car will be able to move a complete distance of 100 meters. This is like the blood flow through a vessel in a healthy person. However, if you push on the gas pedal, that is heart pumping, with the same force, the car may not make it to 200 meters, which is a case of blood flow through a vessel in an obese person. The third and most influential factor that affects resistance and blood flow is blood vessel radius. Blood vessel radius is the most influential because it only takes a small change in radius to result in large changes of resistance and blood flow. Also, vessel radius is adjustable, with blood vessels changing in radius as the nervous and endocrine systems adapt to the physiological needs of the body. As we can see from the equation, the resistance of blood flow is inversely proportional to the radius. Therefore, the smaller the radius, the greater the resistance and the lower the blood flow. The primary reason behind this relationship is because when the blood vessel has a smaller radius, the volume of the blood has more contact with the blood vessel wall. As such, there is more friction between the blood and vessel wall and more resistance against the movement of blood. During vasoconstriction, the blood vessel radius decreases, thus resistance increases and blood flow decreases to tissues. During vasodilation, the blood vessel radius increases, thus resistance decreases and blood flow increases to tissues. For a relatively simple analogy, again, consider cars and the roads they travel down. A four-lane road will allow more cars to move down from point A to point B than a two-lane road. When we consider the vascular resistances exerted by all of the systemic blood vessels of a similar type, this is referred to as total peripheral resistance. Let's briefly discuss the total peripheral resistances of all the different blood vessels. The radii of arteries and veins are large, so their total peripheral resistances are relatively small because most of the blood does not come into contact with the walls of the blood vessel. Capillaries and venules have higher total peripheral resistances than arteries and veins, but still lower than arterioles. Arterioles contribute the most resistance of all the types of blood vessels because they have the most smooth musculature considering their size and are the most adjustable regarding dilation and constriction. The importance of this is that a major function of arterioles is to control total peripheral resistance and as a result, also blood pressure and blood flow to particular tissues. Therefore, it can be said that arterioles control the blood flow into capillaries and ultimately the degree to which nutrients and gases are exchanged with tissues. For example, during exercise, arterioles leading to the skeletal muscles, lungs, and heart dilate and increase the blood flow through the capillary beds within these organs, thus fueling the tissues required for exercising. In contrast, during rest, arterioles delivering blood to the digestive organs dilate, thus delivering more blood flow through the capillary beds within these organs and allowing more nutrients to be absorbed and carried away for storage. Now let's do a quick recap. Let's briefly go over the three main factors that affect blood flow and the factors that influence them. The three main factors that affect blood flow are resistance, velocity, and pressure gradient. Let's first review the factors that influence resistance, which are blood viscosity, vessel length, and vessel radius. Remember that as blood viscosity and vessel length increase, resistance also increases. However, as vessel radius increases, resistance decreases. Moving on to velocity, which is mainly influenced by vessel area. Remember that a higher vessel area means slower flow and a lower vessel area means faster flow. Lastly, pressure gradient, which is influenced by vascular compliance, cardiac output, and vessel type. Recall that higher vascular compliance means less pressure. For cardiac output, the greater the blood pressure, the higher the cardiac output. And for vessel type, remember that arteries have the greatest pressure while veins have the lowest pressure. Therefore, pressure decreases going from arteries to veins. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it helps you better understand the concepts of hemodynamics and all the factors that impact blood flow through the body.